In 1963, Sir Bernard Lavelle, under the USSR's instructions, told NASA's Deputy Administrator, Hugh Drysdon, that the Russians could see no immediate way of protecting cosmonauts from the lethal effects of solar radiation. Were the Russians lying? If the Soviets were lying, it certainly wasn't the first time, nor would it be the last. There was a great deal of political posturing and rhetorical gameplay in those days. The Soviets could very well have been using Lovell as a means of trying to pry into our technology. What could the Soviets possibly have to gain from America's inferior technology? Right from day one, Russian cosmonauts always had the privileged luxury of riding in a spacecraft with a sea level pressure nitrogen oxygen atmosphere because the Russians have always had their mighty R7 Samyorka to lift the heavy walls needed to contain such an atmosphere. The Americans had to wait until 1981 to have that pleasure. Until then, they were riding in lightweight capsules with a low pressure pure oxygen atmosphere, launched atop rockets with very little lifting capacity. Even the Saturn V couldn't deliver this. They were making overtures to a joint mission to the moon with the United States. And we all know what eventually became of that. ASTP, MIR, the ISS, and various other joint projects between Russia and the US. But we were suspicious of their intentions. The real reason for their apparent unwillingness to continue with the race to the moon was more economic than anything else, but they had too much pride to admit that. False. The USSR had proven their capabilities with their Zonda program, a project to send a Soyuz capsule minus the orbital module around the moon launched by a proton rocket. And despite Leonov's pleas to fly it, the Russians refused. Three weeks later, the USSR lost out to Apollo 8. Clearly, it wasn't a matter of economy. And we knew that we were unable to protect astronauts from a huge solar flare like for example the seahorse and unfortunately none of them occurred during the Apollo missions false the records show that over the total time the astronauts supposedly spent in cislunar space there were 30 major x-ray flares I discussed these in depth in my earlier reply to Joseph Grutt I'll put a link in the sidebar we stuck our necks out and took the risks where the Soviets were beginning to opt for unmanned missions. By the way, if there had been a terrible solar flare and if astronauts had died as the result of it, you would be claiming that they were heroes because one of them was going to rat on the NASA fake moon missions and so they murdered them. I don't cry murder without valid proof of such. If an astronaut did die in cislunar space as a result of solar radiation exposure, I would point to this mission as proof against all the other Apollo flights, as even the minor flares can hurt you. And historically, there were 1400 of them during all the past moon missions. The Soviets lied a lot in those days, and nothing they said could be trusted. And yet, you trust that they honestly put probes and people into space? You trust them when they say Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space. You trust them when they say Alexei Leonov was the first man to walk in space. And yet, you don't trust them when they warn NASA of the dangers of solar radiation. Great logic there. Any more than most of what you say. For example, didn't you say this? And all these questions come direct from primary sources. These were three British conspiracist authors with a serious axe to grind and attitude against the United States and the Apollo program. Here's a synopsis I found of their book. It is described as a ponderous anti-Apollo broadside. This book seeks to cast aspersions on the entire space program. And yet you say... And all these questions come direct from primary sources not some spurious article against the primary source. Astro Brandt, did you even read the book? It's hardly spurious. The only thing anti-Apollo about the book 
is that the authors question whether it was worth 30 billion dollars to go to the moon when the Russians were not involved in the race to begin with. They also blame the deaths of the Apollo 1 crew on reckless negligence by NASA and North American Aviation. They also question the honesty of the investigation as all the investigators were those directly involved in the disaster. As far as their axes to grind against the US government goes, the authors simply feel that the whole point of going to the moon was more political than scientific. If the astronauts came in peace for all mankind as stated, then wouldn't planting the UN flag on the moon have been a more appropriate choice than planting the stars and stripes? Otherwise, the book is your average mainstream account of the official Apollo story. Now, it later turned out that the Soviets were indeed involved in the race. The existence of their N1 moon program was never made public until after the fall of the USSR, long after this book was written. I can't fault the authors on an erroneous stance based on info that had not surfaced at the time, but I'd agree that the overall decision to go to the moon was more political than anything else. Quite frankly, anyone who has studied Apollo would know that it's difficult for space historians not to acknowledge that. Though they never called it murder, I'd say their coverage of the Apollo 1 fire is fairly accurate. In the same video, Astro Brandt himself said there may be negligence in the Challenger disaster. People made wrong decisions, and there may even be negligence involved in their failure to take greater precautions and their failure to delay the launch. He also admitted that Frank Borman was not very honest during his testimony to Congress regarding the fire. Was Frank Borman, the thermodynamics teacher, who must therefore have surely known about bomb calorimeters being honest when he told Congress and the Senate that none of them were truly aware of the hazard of pure oxygen. I do not believe that Frank Borman was being completely honest when he made that statement. To tell the truth, I don't know why he made it. I think he would have been better off just admitting that they knew that the test was risky. Challenger, go with throttle up. Challenger, go with throttle up. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. History is not always pretty. You can sugarcoat it all you want, but it doesn't change the fact that NASA did some bad things in the past. Dismissing a book as spurious simply because they accuse NASA of negligence is hardly a justifiable excuse for dismissing the source. That about wraps up all my questions regarding the radiation. I'll resume my coverage of the other questions Astro Brandt dodged in future videos. In response to my use of this book in Exhibit D, Phil Webb did make similar harsh words about this book, but unlike Astro Brandt 2, he doesn't outright dismiss it as spurious. To substantiate his claim that radiation single-handedly brought the Soviet man lunar program to an end, he offers a one-liner from an obscure book critical of the Apollo program, and then he plays an excerpt from an interview with Sir Bernard Lavelle from the BBC documentary The Planets. Bill Casing and Ralph René respectively picked up on a book entitled Journey to Tranquility. Well, if old Bill and Ralph picked up on a book, that alone tells you all you need to know about it. The full title of this book is Journey to Tranquility, The Long Competitive Struggle to Reach the Moon. The full title of the original Kate publication of this book was Journey to Tranquility, The History of Man's Assault on the Moon. That's not exactly a complimentary title for a book that was published in 1969, right on the heels of man's first moon landing. The point that the authors make in this book is that the American space program was not driven by any noble goals or the pursuit of scientific achievements resulting from space exploration that would benefit mankind in any way. In the author's opinion, the tenacious Americans were being nothing less than selfish in their quest to put a man on the moon. It was simply flat, in-your-face, one-upmanship directed toward the Soviet Union. It was international politics. I am not going to argue against an opinion, 
However, the authors do not infer by any stretch of the imagination that the Apollo program was faked, but simply that it was totally unnecessary and way too expensive. Much the same argument is being used today to permanently postpone future moon missions. In it, we find that during a visit to Moscow in 1963, Sir Bernard Lavelle was informed that the Russians could see no immediate way of protecting cosmonauts from the lethal effects of solar radiation. Lethal effects of solar radiation? Really? First, I love it when Jared doesn't blank out the page as he's reading from it. In this case, the very first line refers to three insuperable difficulties faced by the Soviet's manned lunar program as it was in 1963. It should be obvious by now that Webb doesn't have access to the book and has simply scanned the internet for any information he can get his hands on and twist it to attack the authors and the book in general. Here, Webb is implying that I am misrepresenting the facts by not discussing the other two reasons the Soviets listed, but I never denied that the other two were made. In fact, prior to Exhibit D, I had on at least two separate occasions read out this passage and the previous page leading up to it in full, so there never was any denial of the other two. I focused only on number one because it was the number one reason for a reason. 